Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining. In this episode, we have a lot to go over, like always. First of all, there's over 400 companies reporting earnings this week. It's going to shape a lot of the market. We've had this huge run up in prices of companies. The market's gone up a lot, and we're going to see whether a lot of this is justified. So these companies are going to report earnings. If they're not where they should be, I think that we're going to see a little bit of a pullback. These companies don't have perfect earnings. I think we're going to see a bit of a pullback because we saw what happened to Netflix. Netflix had an awesome quarter. They gained 10 million subscribers and they still had a huge pullback because their earnings weren't precisely what estimates had them at. So if this is the case, if these companies, they can do well, but they just can't do perfect and the stock price will drop five or 6%. I think that that's not a good sign for the market, but we're going to see a lot of these companies are reporting every day of the week. We have companies like Microsoft, American Express, Twitter, so on and so forth. So we'll see what happens. Outside of that, we have my portfolio. It's at a value of $105,000. The gains are $4,700. they have been struggling lately. Over the past week, I've gained about half of that, about 1.9%, which is $2,000. But overall, my portfolio has suffered from being mostly value stocks, mostly dividend growth value stocks, and most of the attention has been on tech. That's where everybody's wanted to be is in tech because this is a little bit of an eye-opening thing. Mostly when you look at growth stocks and these high PE ratio stocks, you're thinking risk. You're thinking these companies have a high amount of risk. But what we found with the coronavirus is that the companies that have been growing a lot seem to have the least amount of risk as well. Companies like Amazon and Apple and Microsoft, these ones with these huge balance sheets, they're doing fine during this this crazy time. They're doing just fine. Meanwhile, the companies with the low PE ratios, the ones with high amount of cash flow, low PE ratio, like real estate, nobody wants to own that. That's been trading down like crazy. Nobody wants real estate. Nobody wants to be touching finances right now. They don't want banks. Those are scary. They're highly leveraged. Uh, Even utilities, which is mostly a safe play, has not done as great as it usually does. People don't want to own telecom. People don't want to own industrials. People certainly don't want yucky energy companies. So this is what we're seeing. All these Dow Jones uh, value stocks have not done well this year. The Dow Jones is down about 7% year to date, while the NASDAQ is up 15% year to date, which is mostly tech companies. So what I've been doing with my portfolio is I've been trying to balance things out a bit. I'm trying to expand tech while finding the best value in tech, the ones that have the the best opportunity for the future, as well as the lowest multiples, the ones that I think are the best value. Within that, I've made a heavy bet on Apple. Not everybody agrees with this. In fact, I received an email shortly after my last episode saying the insane valuation of Apple. That was the subject line of it. Their argument is that Apple is not worth $1.7 trillion. So we're going to be looking at this email I think it's a good argument he makes. He pretty much compares Apple to every other leading company in that industry, and he tries to compare the value between the two. So we'll look at this and see if Apple's at an insane valuation. But other than Apple, I have Microsoft, I have Visa, and I included MasterCard. I like these companies, Visa and MasterCard, because I think they're mostly tech companies and secondarily finance companies. Uh, They don't run like banks. They're not traditional finance companies that lend out money. I think they're mostly tech companies. Now, Visa and MasterCard form a duopoly. And I think it's a a game where they always win. I don't see scenarios where Visa and MasterCard don't win. Whether PayPal and Venmo wins or Square and Cash App, either way, at the end of the day, MasterCard and Visa are going to do really well. So this is the growth of my tech portion of my portfolio. I'm going to continue to grow this out. It has a lower dividend payment but I'm sacrificing that to have a better defensive portfolio. I want to have more balance. Right now, if I look overall, about 70% of my portfolio is in value, about 30% is in growth. And what I want to do is shift it to where it's more 50-50 so that whether the NASDAQ is doing well or whether the Dow Jones is doing well, in either case, my portfolio does well because I have the best companies of each different index. So that's the goal. That's the direction I've been going. I've been selecting what I think are the best companies out there in these different sectors the best growth companies and the best value companies. For instance, in finance, I'm doing a heavy bet on JP Morgan. I'm probably going to be selling out of some of these companies to put more money into JP Morgan because because I listened to their earnings report this last week and they were fine. They were profitable. They put a lot of money aside for future losses in case that happens. So even if the economy goes south, I think JP Morgan will continue to go through this okay. They won't destroy book value. 
They won't have to sell off valuable assets. I think this bank will come out very strong. So I'm going to be putting more money into JP Morgan. This is more of a risky bet, but I think that this company will come out strong and eventually be trading back at $130, $140 a share where it was previous to this year. So, so that's been the overall direction I've been taking my portfolio. I'm keeping the value. I have a lot of money in value right now, but I'm trying to build out the growth portion of it to make it more balanced. So that'll be something I continue to do in the future, building out these growth holdings, building out the tech holdings, these really large defensive tech companies that have the really big cash on hand, like Apple that has $200 billion in cash. I'm trying to buy more of those companies because I think that we have seen in 2020, they seem to be the defensive companies. They seem to be the ones that people go to during a downturn. So I still have a lot of value. If value does return, if the Dow Jones does have some kind of surge upwards, you're going to see these gains go up. So I still have a lot of exposure to value, but now I have some exposure to growth as well. And I think this will be overall a better portfolio. I also will point out, if you haven't noticed, I don't have any more bonds. I sold out of bonds completely. I put a lot of that money into the tech sector and I did so for a couple reasons. One of them, I'll go to Ray Dalio, an interview here, and he can explain part of the reason why I don't own bonds anymore. Um, think of it this way. You, you don't want cash because, um, and, 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 and I don't think you want bonds um, because you, you get no interest rate. You get a negative real rate, so you get taxed at that negative real rate. Um, and then, um, so from a holding point of view, it's, it's, it's got no return. And then the central bank's going to print plenty more of it and produce its supply. So there's a move to what is a storehold of wealth. You know, think about it, you know, like all of us, what is a good storehold of wealth? And if you look at history through times, it's basically almost the reciprocal of the value of money. And, and we see that from financing. Um, then it, it's equities, it's gold, it's, it, it is what is the thing that is the reciprocal of the value of money that you have to hold, uh, hold uh, you, you know, your wealth in. And so that's what we're seeing. He's basically saying that the return of bonds is negative because of inflation. They pay out less in interest than inflation is likely going to be. And he suggests putting your money in equities, which have better tools to deal with inflation. And that's exactly what I'm doing. My portfolio is now 100% equities. I don't have any bonds. It'll be interesting to see what happens. This will make it more volatile. Uh, if you want to hold bonds, that will certainly make your portfolio a little bit more stable. But I have a long runway. I have decades that I'm going to be investing. So I'm okay doing 100% equities. If we have another big downturn, the market drops another 30%, I can make it through it. Now, there's an updated link in the description of this video if you want to see all the holdings that I've been buying and selling out of. I have every single holding in that link. Now, moving on to some news, we have to talk about Twitter being hacked. Here's a clip from CNN. Joe Biden today assured his supporters he'll never ask them to send him Bitcoin cryptocurrency for donations. That comes after Biden's verified Twitter account and those of many other famous people were compromised by hackers in a devastating attack. They got to the accounts of former President Obama, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, other celebrities like Kim Kardashian West and Kanye West, and companies like Apple and Uber. And they did it, Twitter says, by doing what's called social engineering. Now, this is actually crazy. Twitter had one of their admin accounts, one of their employees had access to manipulate and tweet out basically every single Twitter account. He got hacked and he got hacked through what's called social engineering, which is a fancy term for saying that he was tricked. He was manipulated into giving up his credentials and to hackers. Once they got it, they either used some way of of an admin dashboard to tweet things out, or they use password resets or something like that to gain access to all these high profile accounts, Bill Gates and Kanye West and Elon Musk. And they use that to tweet out a Bitcoin scam. Here is a screenshot of what they tweeted out. It says, this one's from Elon Musk, but a lot of it was the same from all these accounts. Feeling grateful, doubling all payments sent to my Bitcoin address. You send $1,000, I send back $2,000. Only doing this for the next 30 minutes. And then he linked a Bitcoin address that you could send it to. I have that part blocked out just because I don't want to be sharing a scammer's Bitcoin address. But you might think this raises some red flags. When I first saw this, I thought, 
this raises some red flags. It looks a lot like Elon Musk's account was hacked. And then you actually see the replies and many people sending him money. Here's one from Will saying, sent. And he has a screenshot of him sending $1,000 worth of Bitcoin to that address. It's crazy, but a lot of people did this. They received hundreds of people sending it. In fact, it was over $140,000 worth of Bitcoin sent to this address. Here's a screenshot that I took when it was only 135 transactions. It was $31,000 received. And then it went on for a while, 178 transactions, 4.5 Bitcoin received, which was like 40 or $50,000. It went up all the way to $140,000. That's how many people fell victim to this scan. And Twitter can consider themselves lucky. They can consider themselves lucky that all these hackers wanted to do was make a little money. That's all they wanted to do. And they weren't financially sophisticated. Because if they wanted, they could have made a lot more money and they could have caused a lot more damage. What I wanted to do was go through some of these accounts and pretend for a minute that we have access to them. We're hackers and we want to make a lot of money and we want to stir up a lot of trouble. So let's just go through and make up some pretend tweets. These are all completely fake, but let's just pretend for a second that we're hackers and this is what we tweet out. How do you think people would respond? The first one is from Elon Musk. And again, this is completely fictional. Elon didn't tweet this. This isn't what the hackers tweeted. This is just something I think that they could have tweeted out that would have caused a lot more drama. From Elon Musk's account, they could have tweeted, I'm stepping down from Tesla effective immediately. What do you think that would have caused with Tesla's share price? It would have caused it to tank. They could have opened up a short position on Tesla and said that Elon Musk is stepping down. Now imagine this on Barack Obama's account. They could have tweeted out, I'm changing my support to President Trump, Trump 2020 MAGA. <laughs> for Joe Biden's, imagine them tweeting out, I have tested positive for coronavirus. For Kanye West's, I actually did try to think of a crazy tweet for Kanye West. It could cause a lot of problems. And I honestly couldn't come up with anything. He tweets out so many crazy things anyways that everything I thought of, I thought, well, I mean, he's tweeted out crazier things than that. So Kanye West, I really could not think of anything that they could have done to cause too many issues. And then for Jeff Bezos, I did think of one I thought is pretty good. Uh, they could have tweeted out on Jeff Bezos's account, thank you for your continued support of Amazon. I'm really excited to hit a net worth of over $200 billion. Now I joke around. It's funny to think of what if these tweets were sent out, what would happen? But in reality, this is a significant security concern. These hackers could have tweeted out all these hypothetical tweets. That could have been reality. Luckily, they didn't. Luckily, they just wanted some Bitcoin money and they didn't do this, but that was the possibility. This is a big enough deal that not only did Twitter open their own internal investigation, but the FBI is also investigating this. They consider it a national security concern. They have these type of high profile accounts be hacked and people able to send any type of message is a little bit scary because Twitter is often used to state policy or major events. So uh, the FBI is looking into it. Hopefully they catch the scammers. There's not much that I hate worse than scammers. So hopefully they catch them. But the FBI is investigating it. The stock price really hasn't been affected that much. Twitter released a statement saying we're embarrassed, we're disappointed, and more than anything, we're sorry. Okay, now before moving on to emails, I want to touch on one subject, which is Tesla. This is a company I talked about in the previous episode. I think the company has had a really good run up. I think it's priced pretty high. I think it's kind of expensive right now. It's worth about $280 billion, which is worth a lot more than Toyota. So it's expensive, but it's a great company. So you're balancing those two things with each other. Now, Tesla has its earnings report this Wednesday. That's an important day. If it's in the green, if the company's profitable and it has another profitable quarter, it could mean a lot for the company. The people that are advocates of it, that are behind this company are going to be very excited. I could see the share price race up even more and it could get up to $2,000 a share. With how quickly this company moves, I could see that happening. So there's a lot of make or break with this company. What I wanted to do was just highlight how consistently wrong analysts and people have been around Tesla. In the previous episode, I shared a clip from someone named Aswat Damodaran. This is a valuation expert. This is what he does is he values companies. And in this clip, he talks about how he wouldn't buy Tesla at $1,500 a share. I'll play the quick clip here. I would not buy Tesla at, at $1,400 or 1450 or wherever it's trading. It's like a moving target. But I would not call somebody who buys Tesla crazy. He says that he wouldn't buy it at $1,500 a share, but he wouldn't say the people that are buying it are crazy. He just doesn't buy into the narrative of Tesla. He doesn't think the story 
has a really solid chance of playing out the way people expect. Now, he says that he wouldn't buy it at $1,500 a share, but let's rewind a little bit and look at his thoughts on Tesla at the beginning of the year. Here he is, February 13th of 2020. We have Tesla brought up again, and Aswath gives his current thoughts on the valuation of Tesla, which at the time, the share price was $781 a share. So roughly half of what it currently trades at. Listen to his thoughts and keep in mind, this is half the current price Tesla currently trades at. That said though, for this stock to justify the price, you need to tell a really, really big story. The way I would describe it is you need to give it Volkswagen-like revenues, 300 billion in about 10 years. You need to give it margins like Apple and you need to have a company that invests like no other manufacturing company has before. He says that the story is possible but implausible, that they'd need the revenue of Volkswagen and the margins of Apple. That was early this year. So this wasn't too long ago when Tesla was $781 a share. Now let's go back even further. Let's go all the way back to 2017. This is May 5th of 2017. This is Aswath giving his opinion on the valuation of Tesla during that time and whether he would buy the stock. Let's listen to this audio. There's a value game and I'm going to surprise you. Well, I wouldn't buy Tesla at 295 or 300. There are plausible ways of getting there. I mean, it's not a slam dunk over valuation from that perspective, but to get there, it's going to take some work. I mean, here's what they have to do. They have to deliver about $100 billion in revenues in a decade. They've got to be able to do that while delivering tech company margins and investing like a tech company. Can they pull it off? Well, some people seem to believe they can. I, I am skeptical, but I think there is a way to get to that, that valuation. So even back in 2017, Aswath was basically saying the same thing, that Tesla had to have all of these remarkable things happen in order to justify its value. And that's when it was currently $296 a share. That'd be a complete steal right now with it being $1,500 a share. Now, the reason that I bring this up is not to pick on Aswath. There's plenty of people like him that are smart people that have been skeptical of Tesla over the past couple of years. What I want to point out is that Tesla has consistently proven people wrong. This is a stock that people have been skeptical of, and it's just continued to perform really well. So I hope that continues. I don't own the stock, but I hope it the best. I hope this Wednesday that they blow away their earnings report and the stock goes up to $2,000. It would be pretty incredible to see. Okay, let's get into some emails. Joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. That's the email address, joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. If you want to email in and ask different questions or bring up different subjects or stocks, we'll talk about it here. Now, the first one's from Jack. He writes in with the subject line, the insane valuation of Apple. He says, in your last episode, episode 103, you stated that Apple was worth $1.7 trillion market cap because it is not only a hardware company, it is a healthcare company. It is a finance company. It's a movie production company. It's a wearables and activewear company. And it's a phone company. That's correct. That's part of my argument for Apple is that I see them as somewhat of a healthcare company because they have the Apple Watch, they monitor your health. A lot of people justify buying the Apple Watch specifically for their health. They're gonna be doing sleep tracking and different things like that, that I think people will really value. They also are a finance company because they're going into online payments. They have the Apple Card. You know, they're a movie production company because they have Apple TV Plus. They're a wearables and activewear company because they have the AirPods and the Apple Watch. And of course, they're a phone company. So that was my main argument. I'm saying Apple's more than just a phone company. They control a lot of different segments. Now, he goes on with this email and he says, the market cap of the top companies in each of these industries. So he takes the biggest company in each of the industries I listed and lists off their market cap. Intel has a $0.24 trillion market cap. J&J has a 0.38. JP Morgan has a 0.29. Disney has a 0.2. Spotify has a 0 0.05, Lululemon has a 0 0.04, and Samsung has a 0 0.3. And he says, so if Apple was a conglomerate made up of all the leaders in each of these spaces you defined, by combined book value, it would be only worth $1.53 trillion. He says, what's even more absurd about this valuation is when you compare post-tax profits of this year, 2019, with Apple's post-tax profits of the same year, which was $55 billion, the post-tax profits of the companies was Intel was $21 billion, j and was $16 billion, JP Morgan was $36 billion, Disney was $7 billion, Spotify was $0.15, Lululemon was $0.64, and he doesn't have any data for Samsung. He says, so let's say you have $1.7 trillion laying around and you wanted to buy either Apple or these seven separate companies, 
you would earn $55 billion a year by buying Apple, and you would earn over $80 billion a year by buying the seven companies with Samsung making no money. He says, sorry, I couldn't find the data for Samsung. My question, how in the name of God, Satan, and Zeus, everything that is holy, unholy, and in between, can you justify the valuation of Apple at $1.7 trillion? Sincerely, in the name of your loyal fan, Jack. Well, Jack, this is a good email, so I appreciate you writing in, and I appreciate you being a loyal fan, so I'll try to give you a good answer. Basically, when I compare Apple to the different companies you listed off, like Intel and J&J and JP Morgan, I think that those are all great companies, but I don't think that they have the same moat that Apple has. Apple has this enormous moat. A lot of people that I know, their decision when they're buying a new phone is not, what new phone am I going to get? That's not their decision. Their decision is, what new iPhone am I going to get? That's really their question, is what new iPhone am I going to buy? Most of the people that I know that own an iPhone have literally zero interest in moving over to Android. No interest at all. Android could come out with almost anything and they will stay with the iPhone because the iPhone's been consistent. They already have the ecosystem. They have the apps. They're familiar with the tools. They like the customer support. They like everything about it. So they end up staying. And iPhone can just continue to iterate a little bit of a better version with a better camera, with a better screen and so on. And people will continue to buy them. So I think that's a big part of it is Apple has this enormous brand loyalty that keeps people in its ecosystem. Compare that to Intel. Does Intel have this enormous moat, this enormous fan loyalty of their products? I don't think so. There might be some tech junkies that really like Intel for some reason, but I think for the most part, people just buy whatever processor is the best. So I don't think Intel has nearly the same type of loyalty or moat that Apple does. And you could say the same for J&J. J&J is a great company. I have it in my portfolio, but I don't see anybody saying I have to buy J&J healthcare products and nothing else. They have some brand loyalty. They have some brand awareness, but I don't see everybody saying they only need J&J products. They don't get wrapped into an ecosystem of J&J. The same thing for JP Morgan. It's a great bank. It's well diversified. It has a lot of different parts to it that make money. Uh, It's definitely not going to be making $36 billion over the next year. That was 2019. Just their quarterly earnings was cut in half. So the, the volatility of banks is a lot more than Apple. But even so, if they did make $36 billion, JP Morgan, I still don't think has the same type of customer loyalty that Apple has. There's not as many people I see that say they just love JP Morgan and they have to have every product they come out with. I don't see that at all. And I see that all the time with Apple. So again, huge differences there. With Disney, this is one company where I actually do see the same level of brand loyalty as Apple. There are a lot of people that have to see everything that Disney comes out with. So I think that is one where they have comparable brand loyalty, but Disney's operating a business right now that's really struggling. So that company is going through a lot. Spotify, I think, is a good comparison to Apple Music. I think Spotify is worth more than the Apple Music segment of their business. So that's one I think is a fair comparison. Lululemon, I don't even think is close. That's an activewear company, but Apple's making watches and AirPods, which I don't really see comparable to Lululemon. So to answer your main question, if I had $1.7 trillion just laying around and I wanted to buy either Apple or all these individual companies, what would I buy? That would really be a difficult question. I don't know what I would do in that situation. I might want to own Apple though. I just think that it has an enormous moat, more so than companies like like JPM or J&J or Intel. I think Apple has a better moat than those companies. It still makes a lot of money. $55 billion is a lot of money. And it has $200 billion in cash. It's in tech, which is a good sector to be in right now. So I would feel fine owning Apple, but I'm glad I don't have to be in that situation. That'd be a tough choice. I think diversification is a good thing. I do hold a lot of these companies. I hold J&J, I hold JP Morgan, and I hold Disney. So I like being able to have my exposure to all these companies and not have all my wealth in one place. Jeremy says, hi, Joseph. I really love your show and the work that you do. I was surprised to hear that you work in software development. I recently graduated at 31 with my degree in computer science after working as an electrician for a few years. Congratulations on graduating. He says, firstly, my wife and I have recently started investing in M1 and following the same style of investment strategy that you espouse. We are both in our early 30s. And I find it kind of frustrating to know that none or very little of this information that you and others provide online isn't part of the standard education curriculum in the public school system. That makes you and me both, Jeremy. Uh, He says, we routinely talk about 
how much better off our finances would be right now had there been mandatory classes in high school specifically geared towards personal finance. We live in a capitalist society, so to us it stands to reason that the public education system in that society should teach the basics of how to operate financially within the confines of such a society. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this idea. Secondly, in your previous episode, you mentioned that Apple is transitioning from being a hardware company to being a software company. To my eyes, they aren't transitioning at all. Given the fact that they just announced that they're moving all of their Macs to their own silicone over the next two years, which will mean almost all their hardware is specifically designed by them. I'm not sure that's a signal that they're transitioning to software. Did you mean that they're transitioning their largest source of income towards software? Can you explain and clarify this point? Well, Jeremy, as far as your first point goes, I agree 100%. It is frustrating if you looked back and you didn't have the proper knowledge and you make huge mistakes because of that. And you talk about the public school system not teaching enough about finance. Think about people as well. Many times the cases is that kids that are 18 years old, they go to college, they take out the biggest loans they can because they have no concept of high interest loans. They have no concept of compounding interest. So they take out these high interest loans from banks that give them the money. They don't do any verification what they're actually studying is going to make any money. So in many cases, these students have a huge amount of debt that they can't bankrupt out of, and then they go to school and they get a job that makes an okay wage, not really enough to pay back their loan. They had no concept of how difficult it was going to be to pay back. They have no concept of compounding interest. Uh, None of this was taught. So I feel like we're setting up a lot of people for failure letting them go into college, taking out huge amounts of debt that they're going to be strapped with for the next 10 years. So there's a lot of things I would change. I would teach a lot more finance in high school to prepare people for college, to say, hey, as you're going to college, take out a modest amount of debt. Only take out a lot of debt if you're going into extremely high paying fields. So yeah, there's a lot of things I would change with that. Now, as far as your second question, you say that you don't think that Apple is transitioning to software and services because they decided to make their own silicon. Um, I don't think that that's a big deal. I think Apple's doing what they have done previously, which is they're gonna design this and they're going to push the market to use it. It's the same type of thing when they decided they're not going to use Adobe Flash. They just said they're not gonna do that and the rest of the market adapted around them. This is the power of Apple. They can decide to do something and the rest of the market will work around it. They will migrate over to whatever Apple decides to do. So that's what they've done before. I think they're doing the same thing now. I actually think this is a good thing for Apple. They don't have to rely on Intel. Uh, They can do all of this in-house. They don't have to rely on Intel for deadlines or anything or for innovation. They can do all of it themselves. So I think this will make it a little bit more controlled for them. They're really good at designing hardware, so I don't think it will be any different for this. And as far as the growth of their software and services, this is what I'm talking about. In 2014, Apple had $4.4 billion dollars in quarterly revenue from their services. In 2019, they had 13.35 billion. So they've been growing this over time at a pretty good pace. They've been growing their services at about 13% year over year. So I think it will become a bigger and bigger portion of their company. Okay, well, I'm gonna go ahead and end this episode there. I appreciate all of you for listening, for sharing the channel, thumbs upping the videos and subscribing, all of that good stuff. So thanks for everybody that does that. If you want to chat between now and the next episode, I'm on the Discord basically every day. So you can check that out. There's a link in the description. Otherwise, I will see you guys next time.